of, but actually before we get into that topic, I think we um, need, need to spend some quality time. <laughs> so we'll spend about 45 minutes. <laughs> Seriously, though. Um, so here's the, the major question, and if you only get one take on message from my talk today, it's this. There is no single answer to that. Um, it depends. It depends on a lot of things, and in particular, it depends on what you're going to do with that information, what your objectives are. So that's the first place you should start when you're thinking about it trying to define any of these quantities is what you're going to do with the information, what your objectives are, what are you trying to accomplish. Because that should help really guide the criteria you use for defining these units. And I really think that, in general, uh, there are two major steps that should occur in defining these units. The first is to describe the relationships. In theory, that's a mostly objective exercise. In practice, you know, there's a lot of scientific discussions about how best to do that. But this shows sort of a cartoon of two different ways of de describing the same information content. So this is a familiar tree or a dendrogram that shows relationships among different samples, say. And this shows the same information, just slightly different pictorial representation. So the point is, in this graph here, within these three, one, two, and three samples are much closely related to each other than they are to any, in any of these groups. But then these blue groups, you get, at this level, you get three sort of units, and at the white level, they're all lumped into one. So the second, so after you've done this, <coughs> then the next step is to identify thresholds for how different things have to be before uh, you're going to call them separate units. So this involves how, whether you tend to be a lump or a splitter. And that's, there's not really a single scientific answer to what's best in terms of that. So that, for example, over here, that would determine, well, if you're going to be a lumper, you're just going to push the things back and say, oh, these, yeah, these are different, but they, they're not different enough to really make me uh, really impressed. And so extreme lumper might just say, sure, there's diversity here, but in the bigger scheme of things, those are all can be considered sort of one unit. But you might pick different other hierarchical levels here to focus your attention on. So what are sort of objectives you might have? Well, these are just non-exhaustive examples might be sort of an academic question, you want to have evolutionary questions that depend on uh, identifying biological reproductive units or ESUs. Maybe it's more uh, practical management units, uh, maybe there's some legal mandate that says you have to define some sort of units for management. Uh, maybe uh, you're dealing with harvest, and you want to set harvest policies and make sure they're sustainable. So in that case, you might want to in, uh, minimize impacts on weak stocks or populations, either because uh, if you deplete them, it take a long time for them to rebuild, or uh, you might actually do some diversity if you're not careful by extirpation. So those are just examples of sort of objectives that might help you focus in on sort of units you might want to define. So that's the first take home message that I already mentioned, um, that you really need to think about the objectives. And a corollary of that is, of course, there's no single best or correct way to do these things. There's lots of different ways. So just quickly, here's one example of a situation I got involved in about 15, um, 25 years ago, anyway, when we had first petitions for Pacific salmon listings in the Pacific Northwest under our Endangered Species Act. At the time, I didn't even know this language in the Act existed that allowed listing of what's called distinct population segments 
of vertebrates to be listed. And if they're listed like that, they're treated as full species. So bald eagles, for example, alligators, lots of species have been listed that way uh, in the past. But nobody really, there's no definition, distinct population segment, the Endangered Species Act. It's not really a biological term. So nobody really knew what it meant for salmon. We've got hundreds of populations. I mean, if every population is a, is a DPS, then we've got a lot of units to worry about. So um, we ended up having to develop a policy, and I was asked to write a scientific paper to, to guide the policy. So I started by looking at dictionary definitions of distinct. There are sort of two general categories of definitions you can find. One is separate or apart from, and, and the other is that they're different, or unique or different. So these are related but not identical, so I use those to help guide two criteria I suggested would be required to define DPSs. And so basically we said for salmon, how do you find if it's a DPS? Well, it's a DPS if it's an ESU. Of course, that doesn't, they have to explain what an ESU is, so we proposed that the first criterion was substantial reproductive isolation. Not complete reproductive isolation, because then you probably have a different species, but enough to allow important differences to accrue. So the second criterion then was something that's in had to really be something important to the species as a whole. And this second criterion was added because of concern that if all you have is something like uh, isolation as your criterion, you might have to, you know, somebody had postulated, well, we might have to list the squirrels in Central Park and <laughs> New York City because they're isolated from all their cousins out in the suburbs by urbanization. And that, Everybody agreed that wouldn't make any sense. There's no irreplaceable diversity, as far as we know, in Central Park squirrels. <laughs> so this, this is an important criterion to make sure that uh, you're really talking about something that's important to species as a whole. And after all, we're talking about the Endangered Species Act, that's about preventing extinctions. And extinctions, the, the thing about extinctions is they're permanent, and irreversible because you've lost the genetic blueprint for making a certain type of organism. So um, if it's just squirrels in Central Park, there's nothing really unique about their blueprint. So that, that's really what this is. This is um, tempted. I help identify important chunks of genetic diversity in your own species. But obviously these are just sort of conceptual. They're not quantitative criteria. So there's lots of ways that could potentially be applied. But during the 1990s, we went systematically through all the Pacific salmon and steelhead uh, species in the Pacific Northwest, actually to all of the contiguous 48 states, and we find ESUs, and then the <coughs> process. So at the end of this, people had a pretty good idea what the criteria were for defining ESUs and so on. So basically we had, roughly speaking, about 50 ESUs defined in the lower 48 states for these species, and about half are listed under the Endangered Species Act. So that's a real quick overview of how it's worked out for salmon. Uh, there's a bunch of other ESU concepts in the literature uh, you're probably familiar with some of these. Probably the most widely used is uh, Craig Nitz's proposal that ESUs are defined by reciprocal monophyly of mitochondrial DNA. So part of the reason I'm sure it's been widely used is if you have any genetic data at all, you probably have enough to, to do DNA, uh, mitochondrial DNA. So it's very easy to apply with minimal amounts of data. Um, another one that's been pretty widely used is Crandall et al. It's another tree paper that uh, it focuses on exchangeability. So anyway, there's quite a few different ways to define ESUs. One of the problems is in the literature, people will often say, well, 
I think that ESU is such and such, but they won't explain what framework they're using, or what criteria. So that's kind of a tiresome situation. Um, but it, actually, you can uh, identify some common themes in most of these ESU concepts. And I think the best way to think about it is that there's really two axes to uh, of diversity to think about. First is this isolation axis, and the other is an adaptation axis. Axis. So, uh, in general, isolation uh, can be uh, determined by or estimated by geographic proximity, for example. Maybe you have tagging and migration studies, but often it's done with molecular genetic markers, presumably uh, neutral markers. Adaptation axis. Uh, up until very recently has been mostly conceptual because for the large, for the most part, we had to deal with proxies for adaptation. We didn't have the tools to directly assess adaptations. And for salmon, particularly, we looked at ecological features of the habitat that you get. So if they're really different environmental features, and it seems likely that they may have different adaptations, particularly if there's some reproductive isolation. Uh, and life history traits for salmon are really important uh, for persistence. And uh, there's quite a bit of heritability studies, for example, that show they usually have pretty strong genetic components. But they're also influenced by environment. So uh, this is a challenging one uh, to apply. And so these different ESU concepts have different relative emphasis on these different axes. So Craig's is essentially puts almost 100% of the emphasis on this long-term isolation. And that's what the mitochondrial DNA reciprocal modifier does. And Craig thinks that's appropriate because those are the units that are long diverged. And in that sense, they're really irreplaceable. If you lose those, you're not going to get them back on any sort of time frame. That's very relevant to humans. In contrast, Craig thinks that these adaptations are much more ephemeral, sort of in evolutionary time frames. They can come and go much more rapidly. Not that they aren't important, but that this should be the first line of focus. Whereas the Cranwell et al. paper was largely a reaction to this extreme focus on uh, just uh, molecular uh, differentiation and presumably neutral loci. So they thought adaptation was getting short shrift. So Keith Granow and particularly Bob Wayne have really pushed for more emphasis on local adaptation. So their, their uh, proposal for ESUs puts relatively more emphasis on this. And ours uh, had always put sort of relative equal emphasis. First criterion, reproductive isolation, is largely this isolation criterion. But the second criterion is really mostly talking about adaptive differences, even though for the most part we didn't have direct tools to demonstrate those. So it's a useful way of thinking about ESU concepts, I think, to think about the relative importance they play. And we'll come back to this at the end when we talk a bit about adapting markers and how to think about these. So, yeah, so in addition, there's a visit that's almost 15 years old now, but this nice review paper by Dylan Fraser and me uh, about ESU concepts. So it's a good place to start if you want to look at that. So a couple of types of errors that, that pretty much everybody would agree, I think, you can make in defining conservation units, whether you call them ESUs or anything. So let's say the truth is these green Situation. So this situation, there are really two units, but you define an ESU or conservation unit that's really part, just part of both of those. So that's going to be an artificial unit. It's not going to have much meaning in terms of what's the extinction risk for this unit. It doesn't make much sense. So it's a disconnect between biology and the unit you defined. So that's a problem. Here's another situation that's quite common. Our, our Endangered Species Act allows you use international boundaries as boundaries. For so if you've got a unit like that, could be a grizzly bear or something, for example, that the natural unit is this, 
and you just arbitrarily chopped off part of the unit. Mm. And it, once again, and you're only looking at this part as your unit, but it's demographically and genetically linked and all of this. Again, thinking about extinction and conservation just of this unit by itself, without considering all these interactions here, doesn't is not going to lead to really useful or effective conservation measures. So those are two types of areas that in general you'd like to avoid. So hopefully you get kind of ruins of your unit, whatever it is, with underlying biology. So this, this basic graph just points out that whether you're talking about populations or ESUs, management units, conservation units, <coughs> diversity occurs across a spectrum from complete anexia to complete isolation. And it's complete isolation, and of course there's another spectrum of how long you've been diverged. So the question then becomes, okay, <coughs> um, where on this continuum do you want to draw your line and say, okay, if differentiation is greater than x, I'm going to call them different units, but if it's less than that, I'm just going to know. So that's the generic sort of question, what are you talking about populations? So values of k in structure, exactly the same issue comes up. Um, same sort of thing here, if you have hierarchical structures, <coughs> some people see six units here, they each of the green, green circles. Some say, yeah, but the green ones here are more similar to each other, so really you just have two units here. Some other people might just say, yeah, but they're all pretty similar, like these and five, so it's just one. Again, it's partly a matter of perspective and what you, what you want to do with that information. Um, so again, this just reiterates the point that you need to think about your goals and objectives in defining uh, how different things have to be before you're willing to call them different units. So mm -hmm. one common approach people do is start with statistical tests. This particularly applies to a situation where you have some a priori way of grouping individuals into samples. So mm -hmm. you're all familiar with this. You perform a statistical test to see if the results are significant. And if they are, then you can consider them separately. If not, then often you would like to consider joint. And that's fine as far as it goes, but um, the problems are that, and this is a fairly simplistic hypothesis, you're testing the underlying hypothesis that you've taken two samples from exactly the same population. So the alternative hypothesis is that it's not panmixia, that your samples come from they could be overlapping, but they're not exactly the same population you sampled twice. So if you get a significant test, all you've done is rejected this extreme end of the continuum. It doesn't tell you anything about where you are on this continuum. You could get a really, if you get enough day, you could have a really low p-value for this situation where there's just tiny deviation from pen mix to you, but you have lots and lots of data. If you don't have much data, you can have a really extreme divergence scenario that also uh, just gets a mediocre p-value because you just don't have much data. So you have uh, this statistical test by itself is not telling you much, except you're not here. But in most cases, you probably know that panmixia isn't the only applicable animal. Now, if you sample birds all over Kenya, it's probably not really plausible that there's a hundred exactly same probability of meaning with a nearby bird is one from the northwest corner of the and so on. So there's probably an a priori expectation that things aren't in panmixia again, so that's why the, this statistical test to reject panmixia by itself should not be that surprising. And it's not necessarily that useful, even though it's a fine first step. So the issue then, of course, is statistical power, which is the probability of rejecting the null hypothesis when it's actually false. It's determined by population differences. That's the true differences. That's called <coughs> That's the only biologically meaningful part of this. But it's also strongly affected your power by how much data you 
So uh, this is the only thing that's of interest, but this is, a, in fact, has a large influence on your Qigong. So again, then here you've got a situation where the effect size increases this way, just rejecting no hypothesis is not tell me anything about the effect size by itself. So here's a hypothetical example where you have a fixed FST, very small, but not zero. Uh, and if you have um, different numbers of loci here, you can see with only a few loci, that's not going to be significantly different from zero. I just made these numbers up, I think, but you, you can get values like this depending on your locus variation, FST, and so on. Uh, but you can see if you've got enough loci, eventually you can, uh, for any sort of like this limit, definition limit I showed you yesterday, basically for any small value of FST, I can give you the number of loci that would be large enough to show that statistically significantly different from zero. So here you've got a really low p value, but only because you've got a lot of loci and a tiny effect size. So here's another situation where you got a much bigger FST, but you don't have much data, so it's actually got it's got a just barely significant p value compared to this highly significant p value with a much smaller effect size. So it's just an example of how the p values by themselves are really not that meaningful. Uh, they're just a place to start. And unfortunately, large numbers of people continue to just use the Statistical test and the p-value, that's the end of their assessment of those population genetic differentiation. So really there has to be much more attention, I think, paid to the effect size, the biologically important part of that. So this just points out that um, you can have both uh, types of errors and inference uh, if you don't really consider statistical power. You might miss a real effect if you got a little bit of data, but also you, um, just because you show a statistically significant result does not guarantee it's a biologically meaningful result. Um, and also, in addition to the fact that you might detect a really small true effect, you have all sorts of artifacts, like tiny departures from random sampling or scoring errors and that could lead to a significant difference in the test <coughs> that are, is purely artifactual. And the chances that that occurs are greatly magnified when there aren't any true differences. And you get a lot of data. So the more markers you have, the more you have to worry about these small departures from underlying assumptions that, that turn out uh, that you may interpret as some actual signal that's really just an artifact. So that's a going to be increasingly serious concern with genomics data, I mean, you get thousands and thousands more. So again, then, the second take-home message, the, the, the slide to start with statistical tests, but they don't answer the question, is it different enough? Uh, and so you really have to think about power, you have to think about the relationship between statistical significance and biological significance. And this is another paper that Parks on the same thing. So, thinking about populations specifically, we did a paper a few years ago, uh, Oscar Gaggioli and I, we followed up a paper we'd done in the on assignment methods. And what we realized, what we noticed then was that everybody's talking about populations, assigning individuals to populations, they use structure and their focus. As, as somebody pointed out, there's a unusually strong attention to what is K, how many populations are there. Everybody's talking about populations, but nobody's explaining what they meant by a population. So we thought, Oscar and I thought, oh, we'll solve that problem. We'll explain what a population is. Well, we started, the more we thought about it, we realized, of course, that's not a solvable problem in the sense that there's not a unique solution for all the reasons I just explained to you. But during the process of that, we realized that 
Most uh, we started looking through ecological textbooks, evolutionary textbooks, statistical textbooks. If you set aside the statistical ones, where they basically define a population, and any group you're interested in drawing inference from is not really a biological concept. Biological concepts of populations pretty much can be sorted into these two paradigms. The ecological paradigm, the cohesive forces are demographic, so they have to be co-occur at the same time and place and the opportunity to interact for things like computation, prediction, and so on. So then the cohesive forces there are demographic. Evolutionary paradigm requires interbreeding and exchanging the genes. So then the cohesive forces for the evolutionary paradigm on the, on the genetic. So uh, uh, another take home message, when we found those definitions, almost none of them were quantitative. They were all just qualitative sort of statements. So in that sense, they weren't quantitative, they weren't testable in the way they're stated, and they weren't repeatable in the sense that you could give one of those definitions to a group of scientists for the same data and expect them all to come up with the same answer. So again, we think that to help guide the process, you have to go back and think about your objectives. If you want to identify populations, what are the goals? Uh, and these are some of the same sorts of, of potential objectives that I mentioned uh, before. It's not, certainly not an exhaustive list, there's just some of the common types of things that might help drive your definition of population or stock or whatever you want. So then the next step is it's really important to match the type of population concept you have with your objectives. So for example, if you decide that you want to minimize impacts on wheat stocks through harvest, mainly because you're worried that depleted stocks take a long time to rebuild, that's largely ecological paradigm. You're talking about removing individuals from the population and it may take a long time to rebuild. You're talking about population growth rates, which probably involves density of families and all sorts of other things. Those are really mostly ecological processes. But if you're worried about local extirpation and loss of genetic diversity, of course, that's, the, that's more relative to the evolutionary paradigm of populations. So in our paper, we propose just some arbitrary units in the evolutionary paradigm. Basically, genetic methods give you information about this product of effective size and migration rate, the actual number of migrants per generation. So, uh, so again, uh, you can do a statistical test of amnexia, but you can also test whether FST is larger than some value that would be uh, consistent with certain levels of migration uh, or units of any and migrations of a number of individuals exchange. So we just made these up. I mean, you can pick any others, but it's possible to do these sort of statistical tests that FST is greater than some value that's associated with a migration threshold. And if you get enough data, then you may have some reasonable power to determine whether FS, whether migration is lower than some threshold you might want to set. And if you want to see details of that, you can look at our paper. But in general, for testing panmexia or testing against um, these different levels of migration, uh, again, if you get enough data, you can get really high power to tell small departures from pandemics are statistically significant. So even FST values are much lower than 0.01 can be shown to be statistically significant if you get enough data. And then you have to think, is that an FST value or a level of differentiation that I want to be concerned about? And uh, Jonathan mentioned the same sort of thing, you know, with structure. If you get enough data and you need enough SNPs, you'll be able to tell people from Cornwall or, or distinguish all the neighbors down in Land's End corner of England, but does that mean those are different populations or any of these are ESUs? Yes, 
And again, when you're dealing with a signal that's really small, again, you have to really start to worry much more about uh, data errors, uh, non-memory sampling, and other artifacts that may masquerade as a signal. And if the signal's really small, those don't have to be very big before they can cause serious problems in misleading your conclusions. So for the ecological paradigm, it's really, the ecological paradigm, one of the problems of, of using genetic data for these population questions is that most of the management-related questions or problems really relate more to the ecological paradigm than they do to the evolutionary paradigm. So here's a common one. If we over-harvest in area A, it, are you going to get a rescue effect from area B such that this local depletion is filled in? because there's enough connectivity. So this involves not really so much genetic exchange, but exchange of uh, a certain fashion of population every generation to replace it. So it's really uh, oriented more toward migration rate. Same thing with larval dispersal and marine reserve design, for example. <laughs> So those are more uh, logically related to the ecological paradigm when the units are migration rate per generation. Uh, so you can test whether migration is less than some specified level. Uh, it's really odd, but you'd think this would be a really central problem in ecology, is how much migration is required before your population is no longer demographically independent. So it's like really central. The only published data we could find on this was a paper by Alan Hastings about 20 years ago now, that simulation study that found that local beams tend to have independent demographic trajectories if their migration is lower than about 10%. And they tend to be uh, correlated trajectories of migration above that. So that's uh, a yardstick we could use Roughly 10% migration rate might be a threshold for them to and So you could task them whether migration rate was less than 10%. As a general problem with this, though, the genetic data gives you information about MME and not M. So you have to try to translate this and, and account for effective size. And also, the transition from demographic independence occurs in a region of 10%. Migration rate is really high to the and it's high enough to largely homogenize the real frequencies. So, so what that means is that 10% <coughs> migration, that's what this solid line here shows. That's what the uh, for given levels of effective size, the solid line of 10% migration, this shows you what the FST you would expect to find on the right side of the model. And so then uh, these other two lines show what you get with migration that's uh, half as large or twice as large. So that's sort of an envelope of pretty wide differences, uh, twice as high or twice as low as that threshold. And can you tell those apart? Well, if it, if it happens to be the case that any is, uh, if any is only 100, those scenarios lead to very different things. You can probably tell FST uh, 0.025 from FST 0.05 pretty well with you know, more amounts of data. But uh, for larger populations, here it tended, so a thousand effective size, you have to distinguish between FST values that are like all below 0.01, so they're all really small. And if you have pretty large population, 10 to 4, you're, you're trying to distinguish between uh, FST values are all really tiny. That, but as some of those indicate it, that it's well above the threshold for demographic independence, and some of those values indicate it's well below. So your ability to distinguish whether determine whether the population really is demographically independent or genetic data can be really limited. Just it's just an intrinsic problem unless the population size is really small. So that's just basically what that thing says there. So it's an intrinsic problem that's hard to deal with. So now we're getting into the structure sort of question. How many populations are there? Um, 
and uh, if and and Jonathan mentioned this too, if the populations, if you have a good reason to set your individuals arranged into samples a priori, then you have much more power using standard statistical tests to identify populations. So you can use a RYC contingency test or something, or pairwise tests. But if you don't have the ability to use uh, a priori information, or if you have no reason to believe that that information is very relevant to uh, population of origin, then you need to use some sort of clustering method uh, of which structure is, is a great example. So then each individual gets assigned a certain probability to each. It's like having a bunch of buckets to drop individuals into. Clustering, of course, uh, is a much harder problem because you don't have that prior information. You have to partition these into some unknown number of gene pools. And it's really a difficult problem. And it's actually, to me, it's still astounding with this. This is really a hard problem. It's astounding that programs like Structure can actually make sense of really complex situations. Um, so that's the really encouraging part. Um, so this, this just re reiterates lots of stuff that uh, Jonathan has already mentioned about clustering methods. Uh, quick history. There actually was a, this might be the first prototype of structure in the paper, now it's 40 years old, where uh, they showed that in a very simple situation where you have two foci and two populations, you can actually resolve the individuals in the two populations uh, with very crude at that time, or very elegant at that time, with crude by our standards. Methods, but they required, of course, just two populations, and it had to be really strong versions. That quite fixed the real frequencies, but pretty strong. But that idea was there. And then in our paper here that Jonathan mentioned, we were more interested in, in sort of the, the classification approach, this genetic stock identification was used for management of salmon, where they tried to identify stock of origin for fish caught in C. And based on baseline data for lots of populations that might contribute. But we knew that sometimes there were populations in the mixture that were not represented by any baseline. So Peter Spouse, a colleague of mine, dreamed up a, a modification where it allowed this extra stuff that didn't really fit to be put into some single other population. <coughs> that was an undefined source population. And you could then define the real frequencies based on this stuff that was left over from the village bit. So it was a very crude prototype sort of, of structure, which then, uh, a decade later, uh, just said, we don't need any baseline information at all. We can actually make sense of complex. And so it was a huge, huge advance. So in our population paper, Oscar and I looked briefly at uh, how structure worked with practical situations. This just shows pretty standard stuff. These were a different number of migrants per generation. Uh, so this is at high FST point one point two structure got the right answer. This is a very easy problem. And we had uh, I think so like 20 microsatellite loads on 50 individuals or something like that. So we you know comparable to what a lot of people had for samples. If you had FST around 0.05 it was a harder problem because the likelihoods are much more similar for the different values of K, but most of the time structure got it right. But when we had 25 megahertz per generation, which is IFST 0.01, in this case, structure always got, just thought it was one population instead of four. And uh, so it just it was hard to make sense of stuff. So obviously, there's a breakdown at some point, as Jonathan showed. At some threshold, but of course, with more data, you can push the threshold closer and closer to zero. Uh, these are a couple of empirical things I borrowed from John Hess, who was a postdoc in our lab two years ago. This shows uh, data for olive rockfish, and these samples go from Southern California to Alaska. So, this population is a huge uh, species, large populations. Uh, 
almost magnetic across here. And so you look, if you give, if you try to tell, here's, here's the plot that says clearly k equals 1 as by far the highest likelihood running for structure. But if you try to force it to k equals 2, it just takes every individual and pretty much splits them in half. So if you get a graph that looks like this, this is a very strong indication that k is too high because it's trying to, it's, it cannot partition individuals into two different populations. It just throws up its hands and say, you stick a gun to my head and say, there are two populations. My best bet is just to put everybody in 50-50 you know, in each one. So that's a good indication that the case is right. Um, but here's a real interesting situation. For another species, again, we're going from Southern California to Alaska. Very similar, but not exactly the same. It's much more uh, ragged, not, not right at 50% for every split. And also, there's a transition here. Right about here, you go from most individuals being sort of like one third green and two thirds red to the opposite. Uh, and it turns out that this transition, fairly sharp transition, occurs at Cape Mendocino, which is a very well known zoogeographic region in the ocean, or a faunal break for many marine species. So this suggests that in spite of the fact that there's no, whoops, there's no strong indication that K is greater than one, something is going on uh, in the vicinity of Cape Mendocino that was picked up by structure in terms of the relative <coughs> shift in the apportioning of the different uh, mixture fractions for each individual. So I don't know, Jonathan, have you ever seen something like that where it, K equals 2 was, there's no clear indication that K equals 2, but there's something going on here? Not sure. So like if you blow up that, I mean, if, you, if the numbers really I mean, it's a little bit hard to tell on the y-axis. That's why I'm blocked. Yeah. Like, yeah. Um, like if there's a few units different between one and two. And yeah, I, yeah, I'm not sure. I just have Jonathan's mm -hmm. one here. but I, So I'm not sure which one was slightly favored, one yeah. or two in this case. Yeah. But it's clear that it's not, <laughs> there's not two really discrete gene yeah. pools, but something is going on with them <laughs> that was picked up by the apportioning of the mixture fractions. Yeah. I agree, it kind of makes sense, right? Like, uh, I mean, as you're saying, the signal is structured really, really easy, but you know, given you know the geographic information, you can see yeah. actually something there. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I didn't have that like, problem with that. Um, so, um, I also work on a lot of marine species, and I, 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 we find this kind of thing often, and I think it's a, an effect of these high gene flow species and, and the power of being able to detect and um, these kind of, um, you know, because for example, okay, we work on microsatellites mostly, but you know, we've got a lot of alleles and a lot of shared alleles, so even when we're finding significant FSTs, often structure is only, only able to find the really major units, yeah. and then normally what we do is like a hierarchical structure sure. yeah. to find the, the subsistence right. population. Yeah. So this would be interesting to see what if you had 10 times as many loci, for example. This was, I'm not fairly certain, the, the typical array of microsatellites, I think, which was done at least five years ago. Um, but it's an interesting example. Yeah. What's having population? 12. This is the population 12. Here? Yeah, this seems to be like a lot of Green and of and then yeah. Uh, yeah, there's lots of uh, you could overinterpret these sort of things. I think we reach, but to me, that the biggest thing is that sort of shift there, fairly abrupt. It suggests it's something biologically strong. So, a quick summary of how many populations uh, clustering methods can have really impressive performance, but it's well known they have reduced power for high gene flow species. Uh, with more data, it's clear that you can push the resolution closer toward the low, very low levels, but how far that process can go is still a bit uncertain. Um, 
And if your potential populations can be identified and sampled ahead of time, then standard approaches are much more powerful for telling <coughs> population differences. And here's an example just related to the assignment I gave you folks yesterday. If you look at the back of the assignment sheet, there was some other stuff that in previous years, like when Jonathan was in here, I've been asked to cover structure briefly, and I give people some exercises. Well, you use simulated data and then run through some exercises to see how the structure works. But this just shows, and you can do this with your PD pop simulations or something else. Here's a situation where we had the actual FST for four populations was 0.013, that's pretty small. Um, and uh, this is what you get if you have 100 SNF loci. Now there's four colors there, but you'd have to be, I guess there's slight hint of something going on, but it's pretty messy. You, mean, you wouldn't necessarily say there's four populations there. But with a thousand SNPs, all of a sudden it's almost really quite clear. And with 10,000, it's not much clearer than with a thousand. So somewhere between a thousand, a hundred and a thousand SNPs, a huge transition occurred in the power to resolve this low FST situation. So this is the sort of thing you can evaluate fairly easily by yourself, just by, if you have data sets that you're interested in, you can simulate data that's sort of roughly comparable to the sort of data you have and see what power you have and how much it might change if you have additional markers and so on. That's quite easy to do. Okay, briefly then, uh, some strategies for dealing with high gene flow species when you're in this situation where the signal is pretty weak. Um, first of all, again, it's important to clarify your objectives. Make sure, are you really interested in, in does it matter if the signal is so weak? If you even care, maybe it's not a big deal. If you're just sure that it's really quite weak. But in many cases, you still may be interested in that. So you can get more data. Uh, but you also have to really pay careful attention to sampling protocols because they can have a big influence on the result and also your power. You really have to worry about departure from random samples. You have to understand the life history of the species to know how many of your samples relate to random samples from the population. Uh, temporal replication can be the biggest, your biggest friend here. If you get a weird signal and you only get it once, it, there's all sorts of possibilities that it can represent. But if you sample independent time periods, several time periods, and you see the same signal, you get much more confident that it's something biologically meaningful. And again, sure, start with statistical tests, but that should not be your end point. And really, it's important in these cases, I think, to combine information from all possible methods. This includes integrating genetic, life history, ecological, tagging information, any information you can get to help inform your conclusion <coughs> about what's going on biologically. And finally, here, before we go to the last section, um, this issue of sampling. Somebody asked about isolation by distance. Here's a situation we've got to find our isolation by distance. And it's, um, in this case, we just assume that there, somebody has three samples. As shown here. Well, somebody pointed out, and actually Mike Schwartz, uh, Mike still here, he has a Mike took off. He has a nice paper showing how called how sampling matter or something like that that shows if you have this situation and you're using structure analyses, you can get some really misleading conclusions about what's going on, depending on how you sample. And that's true enough. However, the point is that you also have problems if you just uh, put these in standard models like FST. And if you put these three samples in any sort of standard FST thing, it's going to show that this one has a really divergent FST compared to these two. And this, these two comparisons of S3 to the other two are going to be statistically significant, whereas this one probably isn't. So you probably are going to conclude that this is, you'll have two populations here, this one and this one. And it's just as misleading, and it's not the problem of the tests or anything. It's the problem of your model is a discrete population model, and you're trying to impose it on data that are, don't fit that model. So in that case, all sorts of analyses can 
to these misleading results. So you really have to think about this, what's appropriate for your species. Okay, so before I close, I want to talk about adaptive markers of conservation units. We talked about that some last night. Um, it's really become a hot topic because for a long time we've heard that information about adaptive hillside for non model species are coming. They're coming, they're coming. Well, they are here now, and we have them uh, in state. So every time you turn around, somebody's publishing a paper with some outlier bullseye identifier. And often they've been uh, related to some gene that you could make a story about how it may be influencing adaptation. So what do we what do we do about these situations? Um, so we can go back to this basic um, sort of two axes way of thinking about the problem of ESUs or conservation units in general. And think again, you've got an isolation axis and you've got an adaptation axis. So the, the major change now is in the past, we largely had to rely on proxies for this adaptation access, axis. Now we've got genomic data. In addition to all these things like phenotypic traits and so on, they give us information less directly about adaptation. So that's a big difference. How do you integrate these into thinking about these conservation unit concepts? So here's a generic sort of example. You might get a situation where uh, you uh, do a genome scan and you find some putatively adaptive markers that single out samples four and five as being really different from everybody else. So that's, that's it. This is four and five in the tree. Doesn't matter whether you look on this graph or the tree. That just shows you part of the tree is now distinctive in some way. Well, what does that mean? If you had, if you tended to be a splitter, so that you had a whole bunch of these ESUs defined by this one, this one, this one, uh, what does that mean now? Uh, in that case, that mean that would mean every one of these little black groups is an ESU. That may just mean that this is more distinctive ESU than the others. But if you were uh, defining ESUs at this level of blue, say, and you had three, now you've got a outlier adaptive group within one of the ESU. Does that mean it should be carved out as a separate ESU? Should it be a special unit within that ESU? Uh, it just raises a whole bunch of questions that don't have simple answers. And I don't think uh, really people have thought really thoroughly through this. There is a, a paper most of you probably know that's been talked about here a bit. Uh, Chris Funk and others uh, back in 2012 a tree paper, and they suggested a three-step process for this. Use all loci to define the issues. That's what they did here. Uh, use neutral markers to define management units within the issues. That's what they did here. And then use outlier loci to identify adaptive groups within uh, adaptive groups of management units. So under uh, this framework then, these adaptive groups should in theory, I guess, be nested within the ESUs, but they could be different groups of management units. In this cartoon here that comes right from their paper, it's very symmetrical because every management unit is in one of these adaptive units, so the adaptive units add up to a whole ESU. As you can imagine, it's not always going to turn out that neatly, so what happens when you have only partial sort of stuff? And before I leave this graph, is it just me or every time I see this graph, all I can think of is somebody got to zoom in on somebody's scalp. <laughs> is, that, is it just me or is that something disquieting about this? Question? Yes. Last question about that. So, so last night you gave an example for this sort of thing, which I think is kind of compelling, where you've got yeah. presumably a single gene effect for yeah. spring or autumn spawning. But I, my guess is that would be like a really special or unusual case. I mean, if you imagined, uh, you know, local adaptation to 
uh, with you know, different aspects of the ecosystem, around temperature, food, what, what have you. And presumably that kind of thing is highly polygenic and there may also be many different things in the environment that uh, work the organisms are adapting to. I mean, is, is this kind of thing practical if you move away from something that's related to street like the binary? Well, that's a good question. I'm going to talk about that example next. Oh, okay. We'll yeah. come right back to that. Right. Yeah. Okay, so anyway, this, this is one framework for thinking about this, but it seems like it's, um, it might not be as simple as this in many cases, where you don't have this nice symmetry and everything's nicely nested. So here's a case study that shows, that pretty much follows this. This is due to um, Mark Nimbler, who was, uh, he's from Denmark, he's back in Denmark now, but he did a postdoc in the seed lab. And he was here uh, two years ago and showed these data. So this is herring, where uh, previously with basic, you know, allozymes and uh, microsats, they were able to show three general groups, one in the inner Baltic, this other one around Denmark, and this other one in the North Sea. Um, but it's a big area here, and they thought there was more diversity there, but they couldn't resolve it with the neutral markers they had and getting more differentiation. But there was interest in, you know, there were different management units there that they couldn't tell apart genetically. So that, as part of a bigger study, they went on a SNP discovery effort. This is sort of the early days of SNP development. So they used 4 by 4 sequencing these transcriptomes. So these are expressed uh, products. And um, so they ended up with, um, let's see, several hundred SNPs, I think. Let's see here. Yeah, so they ended up with 200, they did, uh, yeah, so almost 300 SNPs. They used base scan to identify outliers and ended up with uh, 281 SNPs, of which 265 they concluded were neutral, so just some basic arithmetic tells us 16 outlier loci they identified. So then they looked at what sort of conservation units you would get if you used all the loci or <coughs> just the outlier loci. <coughs> so, and they ran both data sets to structure. And actually, I can't remember whether the first one used all loci or just the pure neutral ones. But, so I guess it's just neutral. So if you use the neutral marker data set, here's what you get. K equals three in that case, this favorite. So you get the same three groups that we saw previously. If you use just the selected markers, K equals four is favored. Now you have a fourth group identified, which splits out an extra part of the Atlantic Ocean. So you get then, this is what you get with the, all the data are just the neutral markers. With the adapted markers, you're splitting out this northern part of the North Sea from this part. So you have an additional uh, pure deep conservation unit there that could be a management unit that shows some evidence for adaptive divergence from other Atlantic populations. And you guys have uh, Morton's data set. I think, Gordon, did you send that to them? Yeah. In their email? Email to everybody in other words. Okay, so if you want to run yourself, replicate this stuff, you can. You should have the data to replicate that. They're all structured input files. It should be easy to do if you want to do that. So, uh, and I guess there's some new data that probably is published by them that uh, corroborates this. So anyway, here's a situation where it's sort of nice and clean. You split out this one big unit into two units that then you can decide. Uh, at least there's some markers that you can help these management, whether or not they're adapted, that doesn't really make any difference in some sense. But they can be used for management purposes in fishery analysis or so. Um, here's the last one. This is due to Mike Miller. Still unpublished data, but he assures me it's nearly ready to be submitted. Uh, but this one has to do with uh, coastal Chinook salmon up and down the coast. So here you have, they have samples from Puget Sound here, down into California. 
and they have sampled two life history types. So most, not all, but a lot of salmon have different run timings, they call them. This is adult run timing, so this is when the adults enter freshwater. It's not when they spawn, but it's when they enter freshwater. And in Chinook salmon, there's often what are called spring runs, where they enter typically sort of April, May, into freshwater, but they're not going to spawn until the fall, so they spend a lot of time in freshwater. And the fall runs come in in the fall and spawn very soon thereafter. So another way of calling these are, these are stream maturing, because they're not mature when they come in, they mature in freshwater. These are ocean maturing, because they mature in the ocean, they're pretty ripe and ready to go when they get there. So physiologically they're different. So just for diversity and all sorts of things, they're both are important to conserve. We've all uh, understood that. So um, they sample both early and late in a variety of basins up and down the coast. And you can see that triangles are early and the circles are late. So the triangles are spring run. So when you look at the PCA overall low side down here, what you see is several genetic groups. Within each group, the early and late run times are genetically similar. So you don't have the spring run here in the Trinity, don't look like the spring run in the nearby um, Salmon River. They look like the fall run in the Trinity. And the same pattern is seen up and down the coast. And it's exactly the pattern you saw with Amazons and Microsalmon. So that led us to conclude that this one timing divergence, as, as, um, as Jonathan suggests, is probably a polygenic trait that has evolved by parallel evolution multiple times in different ESUs. So that was one way of thinking about it. And in fact, these different groups correspond very well to our defined ESUs of Chinook um, uh, Okay, so all of that using, this is over 100,000 SNPs, using all those signs, we pretty much reproduced what we had previously with other markers. But, if you look on a small section of one chromosome, and you look, now the people, what's here, this is the distance across a chromosome. <coughs> what you have here is a p-value that's basically a result of a chi-square test looking for association between genotype and run timing, there's basically little association in most low sides between genotype and run timing. You get these really strong associations between genotype and run timing in a very small section of the genome. Uh, if these are five different sites really close together. You can see this is two different groups. So here you can see just basically a cartoon of the, or a heat map sort of, of the early uh, populations and the late populations, it's not quite a fixed difference, but it's a very strong frequency difference, sort of like 10 versus 90 percent or something like that. So it's not quite a fixed, but it, and it's not quite a single locus, or maybe it's a single locus, or very, just a couple or a few very tightly linked loci seem to be the primary determinants of this life history trait. It's really important. So this is a very different pattern than we expected based on previous results. So it, it, it introduces this question of, okay, now we're in a situation where if this is our sort of uh, general pattern we get from 99.9% .9 of the genome, and now, um, now we have just a few markers, one or maybe a few markers that show a different pattern. They are basically taking bits of populations from what everybody else thinks are different <coughs> conservation units and showing that they have strong similarities. So, you know, if we did this right, you know, all the early run populations that would be imposed by, say, this red, uh, red lips. And so it's just basically saying, okay, now we have something that unifies this one, this one, and this one. Several different groups based on evolutionary lineage of all the other genes and by uh, all sorts of other ecological and geographic things and so on. So, what do you do in that situation? That's uh, an open question. I don't think people, have, I mean, we've been sort of talking about it a bit in the background because Mike's had preliminary data like this. 
for a year or two. Um, but it, it really does pose an interesting question. There's no simple, correct answer to what to do here. I think it really requires people to think quite hard about, again, what are you trying to accomplish in defining your conservation units? For example, if, if it's true that there's parallel evolution of life history changes that's happened many times, um, that, that has a different a different connotation to the or it, it lends you to think differently about what are the consequences of losing a population, say of spring men. They tend to be the most threatened because their habitats are under pressure and they, uh, they spend a lot of time in fresh water after they migrate so they're easy to poach and things like that. This view would suggest that it's in addition to anything that the rest of the genome tells you, it's really important to conserve a diverse array of these populations, probably the early human population, to make sure that, that polymorphism is maintained in the population so that it, that it can possibly spread by migration and then be subject to selection in places where that life history type makes sense. So it could have important implications for the way you think about conservation. Um, and I'll close there. Really, to me, it just, uh, we're in sort of a brave new world here where we've been waiting, we've been saying for a long time, yeah, it'd be great to have these, these data on adaptive differences and it should be important to consider in management, but not really a lot of thought has been gone into exactly how you would take that data and integrate it on the ground in practical applications. So that's what we need to think, think a lot more about. Okay. I think it is, we have to start as scientists thinking more about it and then try to help if we can come to some, probably not total consensus, but some guidelines that we can help start sharing with managers. Because um, it's, it's going to be an interesting time, I think. So, um, I think we have a half hour or so. We're happy to take questions. We can do discussion here, or you can spend time on your assignments or so on. Yes? Uh, I was thinking, like, about this thing of adaptive, uh, uh, adaptive markers. Do you include that or not? Don't you think that uh, if you are preserving a high neutral diversity, that, that will be a good proxy for the adaptive? Potential, or it is really necessary to include. Well, maybe that's just a vague question. Well, no, I mean, that's a good question. But I'll tell you, if you ask Craig Moritz <coughs> by weighing that question, you'll get very different answers. So, yeah. you know, people have strong opinions about that, but there, there's not a unanimity within the scientific community. Um, so, um, yeah. Yes. For the final variation, if you have, so anybody who's species with alligator gar, and it's very much isolation by distance, but we've been trying to force it in the units because we have people mm. trying to move fish from one end to the other. Yeah, I know. Yeah. Um, so, what do you recommend for dealing with that? Um, so, you say that these are alligator gars that have fresh water? And salt water. Okay. Um, and the isolation by distance is within a river system or it's across the Gulf Coast or something like that? Along the Gulf Coast and then, yeah, going like and that. And then up Pacific the Atlantic, up the outside. Uh, they end in Port of Cancel, but they go. Okay. So they're mostly extirpated inland, like up the Mississippi. Yeah. But we've got states like Kentucky and Arkansas trying to bring them back. And they want to take these fish because they do so much better on the south. They want to take those southern fish from like Louisiana and move them up. Mm -hmm. And I just don't think people see it. Right. Yeah. Well, um, yeah, that's a tough one because uh, if the biology is that it's a continuous, some sort of continuous distribution or isolation by distance, uh, 
most management agencies are, if they're interested in genetics at all, are, are vastly more likely to understand discrete population genetics. And, and also there may be laws that require them to draw lines in the sand that say, okay, here's where one unit starts and the other stops, so people have full notice. Well, so it, it's a challenging problem for a lot of those legal sort of administrative uh, reasons. But in that case, I guess, um, you could rely on just quite a bit of general information about ecological, maybe an ecologically suitable donor stock. And that doesn't really matter whether it's dis uh, continuous distribution or discrete. If you're at the ends of the distribution, you could argue that, yeah, this is, you have dramatically different environmental conditions in the Gulf Coast and in Tennessee. And um, so uh, you wouldn't, a priori, you wouldn't expect the southern form to do very well in the north. Uh, so they wouldn't necessarily be the best donor stock. I mean, there's uh, Dave Phillip at Illinois Natural History Theory. He's done a lot of work sort of like that with uh, largemouth and smallmouth bass. They have the same sort of thing. Everybody wants a Texas strain or a Florida strain, <laughs> even though they're in Illinois, you know, or Minnesota. <laughs> right. um, so um, I think you could find some health in that sort of literature uh, about um, there's some pretty good you know, papers that have recommended a lot of attention to ecologically suitable donor sources. So maybe that would be your best situation. Dave Phillip, Illinois Natural History Survey, he'd be somebody to contact. He's pretty knowledgeable about freshwater fishes. He's done, dealt with those sort of issues. I mean, the, the, the uh, sort of comparable issue for salmon would be a lot of people have tried taking low river stocks and transplanting them into the upper basin, like in the Columbia River Basin or the Fraser. But the, the lower river ones are not programmed for long migrations. And it's, now it's pretty well known that salmon that have long migrations can be up to 1,500 kilometers in the Columbia Snake River. They have physiological adaptations to, you know, they have to have large stores of energy to get them 1,500 kilometers swimming up the stream. And if you take a genetic profile of a lower river stock and transplant it up there, those guys run out of gas long before they make it to the spawning grounds. Because they aren't programmed to do that. They've already invested all their energy in eggs or, you know, uh, sex uh, competition, coloring, and and so on. So that's just another in the theme of ecologically suitable donor stocks. Yeah. Yes, um, um, with Mike Miller's uh, ancestral uh, polymorphism that he's got for his runtime, couldn't it just be that it's an, an inherited ancestral polymorphism in all of the different lineages? What? Uh, is that yeah, that or so, well, okay, is it? In, yeah. It could be an inherited ancestral polymorphism, um, but what he showed was a very strong association between uh, which allele you have at that genotype, at that site, and your phenotypic expression of life history. So whether or not it's an inherited polymorphism, it, it seems like it could easily go extinct within local populations. Uh, because of selection for one type or another, or just by chance, oh. as opposed to a polygenic trait where you might, it might be the case with a polygenic trait, there might be hundreds of ways to, to go from uh, fall chinook to a spring chinook. And every population that does it might have a different combination of all these different genes, and that would seem to be more, much more robust, You're not like when you use all of these genes that can make you um, Become an early wind time. And just like Johnson showed the thing, was it the height? Height thing. Lots and lots of genes, each with very small effect. So you can imagine that not all populations that are really tall have mobilized the same genes to get to the same point. So 
that was sort of the paradigm people tended to be thinking about, the standard paradigm of quantitative traits that usually uh, determine phenotypes being determined by lots of genes with small effect. So it seems like it may be the case for this, and also in steelhead, even stronger evidence in steelhead, the same sort of runtime thing, that it's down to a very small part of one chromosome. So that just suggests, now, what, <coughs> how common that is, um, is that totally a weird event that is, you know, just sort of a one-off sort of thing, or is it, uh, are we actually going to start to find those much more commonly than we expected? as we do these genome scans in non-model species. I don't, I don't know. But, it, but it's uh, adaptive, right? So it could be under balancing some of Sure. Frequency dependent balancing some of so. Yeah, that's right. It could be. So um, it's just that the, that result is so new and it's not officially published yet. There's oh. Mike coming back in and talking about your study, unpublished study. <laughs> um, is we were talking about some of the implications of, of what might produce that, what sort of selection uh, and historical processes might produce that result we have today and what it might mean in the future. But. Yeah, there's really strong selection on the uh, early round allele. And you can see that in patterns of diversity. So for example, the gene must be is very negative and very significant. <laughs> So the, the populations, uh, the early and late runtime, I mean, they clearly are demographically independent populations. They have small FSTs as neutral markers. They're statistically significant, but not, not large, 0.01 maybe or something. But they clearly are behaving as different stocks, you know, really, and already they're already managed as separate management units. But this puts somewhat different spin on the way to think about it than his traditionally been thought about. John? So I'm, I'm struggling with how, how this would affect management in a, uh, like in a concrete way. So, so in, in this case, I mean, you're, you've got this uh, clear separation between these two stocks, and you, know, you don't even need to know the genetics to think you know, it might be a good idea to, to try to manage both of them separately. Sure. Um, like a, a different kind of scenario would be that you've got um, You've got some locus in the genome that it gives you, uh, that, you know, that, that enables you to do something different. Let's say MHC alleles that would allow, would allow you to um, deal with different pathogens, uh, with differential effectiveness. But you know, in that case, you know, the individuals are living side by side, and I can't think how you would. Uh, I mean, you'd, you'd like to maintain all the MHC alleles, but I, don't, I can't imagine how you could turn that into a management. Strategy. Right. I mean, do, you, do you think that this small yeah. thing is like a really special case? Well, I guess to me, here's how I, to me, if, if you think of the old paradigm where you think this is likely a, a typical quantitative trait determined by lots of little side with small effect, then you would think that, well, if you lose it, yeah, I don't know, maybe it'll take 100 years or 200 years or something, it's still long for human terms, but in evolutionary terms, that's pretty short to get, to get back that that um, that phenotypic type, if they're suitable habitat and so on, if there are conditions that will allow it to thrive, that the humans stop persecuting that life history type, for example. Um, but and so you might you could think of those as largely independent events in each in each place. If we're thinking about these as a whole lot of parallel evolution, but if um, under this new paradigm, it could be that um, in lots of places, there's only uh, one type of the allele. And with one type of allele, you're not going to get the other type by evolution unless you wait for mutation or immigration. So the latter part, the immigration part, means that the uh, conservation implications of what's going on in this stream are not independent of what's going on in the next stream. So if the next stream or the next stream and the next, if nobody's conserving the early run type, then there's going to be nobody who's likely to be a source of bringing that, those alleles into the population to allow evolution to, um, to enhance the frequency and produce a new 
population. So to me, then, you have to think more globally in terms of, instead of just locally, in terms of, okay, if that's the case, then we really have to think about it, at minimum, making sure we can serve our early wind type in a whole lot of places, so that at least the dynamics of migration as potentially spreading that allele that can be then favored in areas where otherwise it, it wouldn't have a chance to evolve. So I'm not sure it, it would lead to drastically change things, but at least that's how I can think just right off the hand. If you might have to think more broadly about how what people do in the next ESU and the next ESU could affect what goes on. Do you yes. Think the argument that um, preserving the early and late run within each ESU makes that ESU more or less vulnerable to like climate change or. Sure. Oh yes. I mean that's already part of it. Uh, you know people. Some people screamed. You know people. Fishery biologists knew they could tell the difference between spring chinook and fall chinook. And lots of them were outraged when, time after time, we said, yeah, we know that's diversity, but we think it's diversity within an ESU, and they're not separate ESUs. Or if they're separate ESUs, you have to put spring run ESU in the Skagit, and the spring run ESU in the Nooksack, because they're not genetically connected like that. So it's not, you create an artificial ESU in terms of lineage in most of the genes, if you put all the spring winds in one area or all the coast in, in, in a single ESU, that would be ignoring the vast majority of genes that show the lineages grow otherwise. So people objected, but once we put them in the ESU, say all Puget Sound and Chinook are in one ESU, there's quite a bit of diversity there, but we don't think it makes sense to have every single Chinook population up and down the coast be its own ESU, otherwise it's just a nightmare in the ESA that's already they manage the separate stocks already by local states and tribes. And so the, the game plan for recovery, they say, of Puget Sound ESU puts a high priority on maintaining the diversity of run time. So there's a high priority already on conserving the spring run <coughs> populations and maybe enhancing opportunities for them. So in that respect, there may not be a drastic change. What I'm saying is that Puget Sound ESU also is going to have to think perhaps more about what goes on in the Oregon Coast ESU or the Peninsula or up in the Fraser River as potentially being <coughs> able to use the long term viability of that early run life history type. If immigration of those illegals is important in maintaining that uh, phenotype. Yeah. So you said it seems like there might not be a drastic change because there's already an emphasis on maintaining both life history types. Yeah. But how do you think it might make a change knowing how the genetic basis of the trait? If you lose that allele or haplotype, you lose that phenotype that is so economically and ecologically important. Do you think that in, in the short term there might be that might be taken into consideration somehow to change the recovery plan and the protection of some of those ESUs that have this early run that's disappearing. Yeah, so like, well, like I said, I think it, uh, it to me, it would um, suggest a broader thinking of connectivity among ESUs as potential sources of this, this important gene which uh, if it's not a polygenic trait, then you can't rely on every population being able to reconstruct uh, early run time Chinook just from a whole variety of, of genes that are likely, uh, you know, if one of them goes to fixation, there's still a lot more that you can solve that problem. So it's a, but if it's a different sort of mechanism that produces that life history trait, just a single gene, then, um, I think, and, you know, we're still already really concerned about the loss of the, those important life history diversity. So to me, the major thing that might change is this realization that, you know, sort of everything might potentially be connected or dependent on what occurs in other populations and other ESUs as sources of that genetic material. I don't know, Mike, you, you have thoughts on 
conservation yeah. implications. I mean, I think, okay, a good example is the Klamath Basin. It's a large uh, basin in northern California and southern Oregon. And um, you know, a couple hundred years ago, the spring run was actually the dominant phenotype in the Klamath. So there's probably a couple hundred thousand spring run Chinook every year, and maybe a hundred thousand fall run Chinook. Um, now, there's still maybe a hundred thousand fall run Chinook, so the fall run Chinook population is relatively healthy. Uh, but there's just a couple hundred spring run Chinook, so really they're on the brink in the entire planet. Yet, the ESU um, is, is not listed as threatened or endangered, so the ESU is considered healthy because both the run timings are in the same ESU, and so there's no legal teeth to protect the spring run. And so the spring run have just continued to decline and con decline to the point where literally um, they're on the brink in the climate, but the same thing is true in all the other ESUs. So in all these other ESUs where you used to have uh, large numbers of early run, spring run individuals, you now have one or two sort of uh, remnant populations that just have a small number of individuals left. So throughout the whole range where the spring run um, phenotype exists, there's really, in most, most rivers it's been extricated, and the few rivers that still have it just have very small, you know, very small populations. There's really not healthy early run populations. And so, yet there's no legal protection because the overall ESUs are considered um, healthy due to primarily the, the high numbers of late run individuals. So, you know, I don't know exactly how, um, what can be done, but um, certainly, you know, certainly having, giving them some legal protection could uh, prevent things like old growth logging in the Salmon River. So the one basin in the climate system that still supports a really small uh, spring run population, there's old growth being logged out of that basin, you know, that, that kind of thing. So, um, you know, we'll see what happens, but that's kind of my thoughts. Yes. So the, um, I, the last time I was involved with the listing decisions was probably 15, oh, more than 15 years ago for Chinook, probably close to 20 years ago we did the coastwide Chinook status suit. At that time, uh, there was, which we had data probably for the mid-90s through then, um, there was no question in the upper Klamath, so that's part of the, the one we were talking about, the upper Klamath ESU which um, had two major run types, spring and fall. And there was no question the spring were not as doing as well as the fall. But the overall assessment across the whole ESU, you didn't know that was identified as a weak point of the ESU. On balance, the review team thought it did not quite reach the threshold that the whole ESU was, should be considered threatened and dangerous. But as far as I know, that's the last time it's been officially evaluated. The ESUs that are listed now, by law, have to be reevaluated every five years. So NIMS has systematically reviewed all the listed ESUs and updated or revised its status every five years and published reports about that. The other ESUs um, are um, not systematically reviewed in that same fashion. So I don't know if Mike's paid, and also since that time we've, uh, at that time we didn't really have much of a, National Marine Fishery Service didn't have much of a presence on salmon science in California, but since then they developed a major lab in Santa Cruz that does a lot of good salmon research, so they've pretty much taken the lead for all the populations in California. So I have not kept up as much 
the, the current situation in the planet. Um, so I can't say whether, personally, whether I think the whole ESU uh, really merits listing now based on threat to one life issue. So there's no precedent for this sort of thing? Because it seems like if there really is this very distinct type and there's a hundred left, that... Well, the precedent, I mean, if both, both Fish and Wildlife Service and National Marine Fishery Service can do proactive listings. They can. Now, we did some of that with the salmon. We got first initially triggered by petitions, and then we started looking. I looked around and said, yeah, we could spend the rest of our life just responding to petitions. The right way to do this is to do post-wide reviews systematically of each species. So we did that. Um, but what hasn't happened since then is any systematic evaluation of the species, the ESUs, about the half of the ESUs that were not listed. Uh, but that's mostly a consequence of enormous workload that all the agencies have are underfunded just to do stuff that they're absolutely required to do. So there is another avenue, uh, you know, our agencies legally required to respond to petitions and do evaluations if they think there's enough evidence to warrant a full status view. So, so that's petition, another option. I'm not even. If my current NGO were to petition, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service has 60 days to respond to. to 90 you? days, yeah. So by law, there's 90 days to respond. And the test is if the petition, quote, presents substantial information that a listing may be warranted, then there has to be a full status view within a year, a year of the receipt of the petition. So that's nine months after the determination. So to my knowledge, nobody's filed a petition for listing Klamath or Chinook since the listing almost 20 years ago. Yeah. yeah, there was actually a petition in 2011, uh, Robin, but it was before <coughs> this, any of this type of information was available. And okay. essentially, um, it was well recognized that you know spring run chinook are in a dire shape, but this argument of evolvability was made. And so, although everyone sort of agreed that we want, there's all these benefits to having spring run individuals in the, in the system, um, you just, you know, there's limited resources and you can't, you can't list everything, and the basic idea was we want spring run individuals were concerned, but if they're lost, if habitat is restored, they can easily come back because it's so evolutionarily plastic. So that was the main uh, justification for declining the petition about five years ago to list to list spring run. Okay, so that probably was handled in the Southwest. Region. Yeah, and I mean it made it made sense given the, the best information they had they had at the time. I mean everyone, you know, it's one of these decisions that could have gone either way. And people were upset, but I think you know if you look at if you look at the genetics and the the, the thought that it's a highly polygenic trait, um, you know the thought that some variation is lost but it can re-evolve by rearranging variation, you know this, these kinds of things. It, it's a it was a reasonable decision. It's a tough decision, but it was a reasonable decision. But I think with the new information we have, this business of re-evolving without the without the variation being present, we know that that's not the case. You know you're not going to get spring run back. Unless that that allele migrates in from another location, but the problem is there's no really healthy sources of that allele, you know, for that allele to, to come from. So, um, you know, I think certainly people in the Klamath and other um, places will, will petition. I expect that based on based on our data, you know. But we'll see what happens. It's it's certainly a it potentially opens up a can of worms. It's hard, right? Um, Maybe it'll, maybe if there's a listing, maybe maybe it will do more harm than good. You know, I don't know. Um, I tend not to think that, but it's tough. You know. Yeah, it's hard. I mean, our agency. I I got to give our agency a lot of credit because um, they stuck really closely to the science. They just turned all the status views over to the science center, and we worked with states and tribes and everybody to get as much information into the administrative record that got considered in all of the status views. We didn't make the listing decisions or recommendations in the status views. We just tried to present the state of the science. But then the agency pretty much just took that and turned that into listing determinations. And a lot of it was not convenient for them but like we saw, about half the remaining salmon populations on the West Coast 
except Alaska, are now listed on the ESA. And that's had billions of dollars of economic consequences. So when you got to some ESUs that were kind of borderline, um, you know, they had some really healthy aspects, but some that are really concerned, um, you know, it's not too surprising that on some of those the agency decided not to list them because there also, you know, had to be some concern about backlash. You know, if you can explain to people, yeah, this is a no-brainer at Redfish Lake when you're down in Lonesome Larry and a few friends coming back or, you know, other things, but when they can go and see, geez, we got hundreds of thousands of Chinook in the Klamath, how come they're listing? It becomes harder to explain and so some of those ones that were on the borderline, I think, which, as I recall, have found flaws, probably just <coughs> risky. Um, they're tough. They're tough. Yeah, so. <coughs> Thank you. That's a good discussion, a good example. It might become an example of how genomics can lead to conservation <coughs> on the ground. Because, like I just said, they've been petitioned before, but they didn't know there was a single locus or cone somewhere recently. So if it were petitioned again, it sounds like there's a chance that it would be listed and there'd be protection. <laughs> well, I think it should potentially be listed under a different framework than the traditional framework. So I, you know, I don't know, but that's challenging to try to come up with some sort of new multi-dimensional um, framework. You know, I don't know. I have no, I, I have no sort of concept of, of that. Well, we have the criteria for resiliency and redundancy when we make listing decisions. So I think that you know having the spring population would fall under that criteria. Um, so they, basically, there needs to be a way to rescue the population if anything happens. It needs to be less vulnerable to change. So I feel like having the spring there, we could make the argument that it helps satisfy those. <laughs> Am I going back to Jonathan's uh, statement? What if you've got uh, another allele that's clearly under selection and it looks, you know, it's, it's, it's very strongly uh, important, but you don't know what it's important for? Um, you've, got, you've got a phenotype here which is yeah. early and late run, so, so then what do you do? Yeah, I mean, I think it, that's really interesting because theoretically we could have found this without knowing the phenotype. Right. So if we didn't know the phenotype, the patterns of genetic variation are so obvious that everything that we saw. We, if we would have looked appropriately, we could have sought and revealed it without having any pre-phenotypic information. And so, you know, then it's sort of um, obviously something important is going on. But again, it gets to the point. You know, as we collect more and more genomic data, how how often will you see something that's so obvious and so strong? Well, if you see it so often that it's not practical to to actually respond to it, you know, but exactly how common this is, I don't know, you know. Um, I but think it, we're it just could be like a MHC locus, right, which yeah. is really important. But it also it raises a question, I think somebody uh, raised this point yesterday, and last night in the discussion, when unfortunately you weren't there, Mike, or maybe it was just talking with somebody individually, but, so this is just one locus and one phenotypic trait, so, uh, what if, uh, you know, a half dozen more of these things occur somewhere else in the genome, and um, then we redesign the ESUs and everything just based on this one, what about these others that, that um, you know, they're not getting any attention? So is it, anyway, it raises, yeah. you know, if you're going to do this, maybe you ought to Make sure you've got a real thorough gene scan so you know all the partitioning of the really important uh, potentially adaptive markers. Then you can make a decision that, that is better informed about consequences. The, the nice thing about having the phenotype is it's very easy to make an economic and you know cultural and environmental case. Why you know I, I don't think there's anyone out there that doesn't think or doesn't obviously know the benefits of having early run individuals. I think it provides fisheries all year round instead of just for a very short window, right? These fish access habitats that aren't accessed by late run individuals, right? I mean, culturally, the, the early run, um, the early run life history was very important to the tribe, so they focused their harvest on early run individuals traditionally. 
because they taste so great relative to late run individuals, because the fat content they have to store to be able to survive an extended, extended period of time in the fresh water. So, but yeah, it's, it's much harder to justify um, when you don't know, when you can't just put obvious economic benefits, you know, cultural and environmental benefits to something. Yeah. Uh, yeah, what about some uh, reactive civilization? Like the continuum that you show, like we don't know where we are, like uh, you know, five units and those are to use uh, algorithm for clustering. There is a recent paper which talked about using clients to uh, detect like those like kind of different units and and um, eliminate raise the barrier, for instance, you have a big shift in LA frequencies, so or you can see how LA frequency interests among different populations. So, for instance, you pay on the slope that you have also in the big change of LA frequency, are you in this continuum, or like, are you very like, connected? So, um, it's, very, it's a recent paper of Kanye and Hal, which is uh, recently published, but I think it's a, it's a really nice way also to detect this kind of barrier, and, um, and also how, where we are in the continuum, but I don't know if you... So you're talking about where there's two continuums I talked about. One is continuum of how from weak to strong population yeah. differentiation. But I think you're talking about a, like a decline, <laughs> continuously distributed population. Are you, are you saying, are you talking about a recent paper, are you saying that the slope of uh, changes to. over time? You're talking about, say, the yeah, slope of real well, frequency? I think, yeah. Yeah. Do we have to infer like how many, how many nutrients that it's exchanged between the population right. and help to delineate in a weak system like mine species, even if it's diverged for like a recent time, to help to delineate really where, where we are in this continuum? And in the same way, then we talk about this on the like in the shift in high frequency for mine. And is this like the genuine client help you to, um, to analyze this signal? That is a utility to see now. You can, you know, see like the other frequency of many, uh, I have all of many losses at the same time. So it will help also to better infer where we are in terms of neutral and adaptive also. I think. So is this is this a paper, Nicholas? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 So I think I know the paper. Uh, so anyway, the comment is there. There was a recent paper dealing with. Lines, particularly, it might be applicable to many species. It might be useful in this context. Could you email that to the group? Yeah. So, uh, and any notes you want to make? I think a lot of people couldn't hear your full comment. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I think we're close to lunchtime, right? So tonight. Um, I think we're going to have a short session after dinner, just talking about future sort of things, and then come back down here. Is that correct? Yeah. Or hands-on right. sort of stuff. So at the near the end of dinner, dinner at six, right? So around six thirty, whatever. You will like last night. Get comfortable and group together around those tables and have a short discussion session. Um, take home messages. Ask the instructors to think about. A take home message they might have for um, generally or specific about data analysis, generally about success in, in, in science. And then we'll come back down here. And then, so let's plan uh, around 9 30, probably.